Hey, as a quick note before we begin this episode, I've got some self-promo stuff I should probably do. Uh, first, I've got a Patreon. Uh, it's not finished, but it's functional, and it's got Discord-related stuff, including access to private channels on this public server, which is linked below, uh, where you guys can just come and hang out while I work on each video. I'm currently workshopping some ideas about uh, what else we could do. Maybe Patreon movie nights? I don't know. I don't know. I'm working on stuff. I'm going to keep working on it. Just sort of letting you guys know it's there. Also, I've got a merch store that uh, comes out with weekly uh, designs based off of features or ideas from each individual video. I have one for each week so far, including this week. Uh, it's always a new sticker. There's always a new t-shirt design. And I'm wondering what I can do about hats, but so far I've only got the 92 days hat up there. Uh, it's a trucker hat. It's a cool little design. Uh, I actually picked up my own 92 days shirt in the navy blue variant. Extremely comfortable, very nice material, very solid print. I'll probably end up buying one of each when all is said and done, uh, but that's for later on down the road. The shirts come in black, gray, navy, and red. The stickers come in three sizes, 3x3, 4x4, and 5x5 inch stickers. And uh, the one hat comes in all navy, all black, black with white netting, and navy with white netting. Um, again, it's trucker hat style. If that's not your thing, that's fine. I'm still experimenting with how hats will work. But pretty much just want to let you guys know that stuff. Uh, also, if you want to be notified of when a new video is uploaded, please make sure to subscribe and, you know, the bell icon and all that stuff. Uh, it shows me that there are some people out there who actually think that some part of what I'm doing has value to them. And honestly, that just helps me continue to stay motivated to do everything that I'm trying to do. Uh, thank you guys very much for everything so far. That's pretty much it. I've got some other stuff, like I've got a Twitter, but I don't really use it all that much. If you really want to, like, if you, if you really want to go and follow that, um, you can, but I've barely ever put anything up there. Um, and I do have a Twitch, but I haven't streamed in a while, and I don't know if I'm going to keep using Twitch or if I'm just going to stream on YouTube once I have the time for it. I'm pretty sure that is everything. That's also one page of the script written and recorded for me, so that's pretty nice. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, I'll get to it now. Thanks. Last week, we spoke about the importance of education throughout history, with specific focus on the American university system. Discussing the maturing of the system from a group of disparate local colleges often focusing on the training up of evangelical preachers through religious seminaries, to the earliest examples of what would become the various state universities. From various tutor-based instruction, through local educators to what would become known as some of, if not the best, masters and PhD programs in the entire world, covering practically any and all topics, and from a system nearly autonomous and self-sustained towards one that relied on the acceptance of its students and what the system could get from them. I shared a detailed yet non-filibustering backstory to the system and ended rather matter-of-factly approaching what it is today. This week, I want to explain and hopefully prove the failings of the system and why it has allowed itself to fall so far. I want to discuss the obvious disconnect between the administration and those they're responsible to. I want to discuss the open and blatant biases so often preached and forced down the throats of these well-meaning and innocent students. I want to discuss the horrendous misappropriation of funds throughout higher education and the near infallibility of tenured administration. I want to discuss the open disregard for this nation's laws and the vicious cyclical nature of the relationship between academia and the government, both state and federal. I want to talk about why it is all broken, how it may be able to fix itself, and why it just might not matter anyway. 
while at times I'll most likely become more than slightly angry in my tone and my words, I do not wish to give the wrong impression here. I'm not here to call for torches and pitchforks, nor do I ask for the tearing down of structures and monuments. Today, part two of what is most likely going to end up being three parts at the very least, I'm here to discuss why it has become almost entirely meaningless to go to a four-year university, and why that may end up being a good thing in the long run. It's a school you may not have heard of, the Dr. T.J. Owens Gilroy Early College Academy. It is just south of downtown Gilroy, near Highway 101. Let's begin with presenting my own qualifiers. I do believe it's important to explain where I come from and why it matters to me. I recently finished my second year at Kansas State University, and before that I had gone to what is known as a early college academy, specifically Gilroy Early College Academy back in California. From now on, I'm more likely to call it GECA, so just be aware of what that acronym means and we should be fine. It's one of the many thousands of programs across the world funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The dream of Dr. T.J. Owens exists in what I believe is a dichotomy of a new foundation being laid in hopes of a brighter future and a diseased, rotting carcass of a system long allowed to poison itself while trying to claw its way back from being uprooted. As the function of how this school was designed, it was an opportunity for students to attend college classes throughout the entirety of their high school career, with the optimal goal of ending your senior year with a combined high school diploma and two-year associate's degree in one of the many offered course paths. The idea and promise of the school was the ability to leave high school and have completed two of your four years of a bachelor's program, allowing you to focus on the subject you wish to pursue rather than the rehashing of more or less unnecessary classes. To anyone who hadn't attended, it may have sounded like a dream come true. After all, why wouldn't you want to be able to skip through a portion of college? Who in their right mind wouldn't take that offer? The reality of the situation is not as rose-colored as one might assume. In practice, Gecko was, and as far as I know, still is, one of the most inefficient, self-centered, deceitful, and overrated schools I have ever known. The teaching staff, though not without exception, some of the most self-aggrandizing, overconfident, underprepared, and outright lazy instructors that I have ever had the displeasure of studying under. For the life of me, they have never once made concrete decisions that have actually improved the educational efficacy of that student body in their entire lives. The best of them have either left for greener pastures or retired altogether, for which I congratulate them. The rest intentionally disregard any possible criticisms that have any measure of validity whatsoever, always blaming their direct superior all the way up the chain. And while I have no personal qualms with the people actually making sure the school runs, at least those that were there at my time, I find it absolutely absurd and to some degree disrespectful to disregard the outcry of your students when there were problems only you were capable of fixing. And that doesn't even take into account how absolutely disorganized and disingenuous the staff as a whole were when even the slightest thing was inconveniencing them. Let's not get started on the inter-school relations between Gekka and their Gavilan College patrons. Coordination was, for all intents and purposes, completely thrown out the window when it came to those two. Alright, if I go on for too much longer with that, I will have filled three whole pages. I have a lot of animosity towards that school, but that may have to wait for another video. In short, I went to a junior college for the entirety of my high school career, achieved a rather useless but informative associate's degree in liberal arts, and upon coming to a four-year university, I found that the only real difference in classes was the immense increase in cost, while the quality of instruction either stagnated or dropped off, but for individual exceptions. So, when I say that I've been to college for the last six years, I have been to college for the last six years years. It literally means nothing that I'm only 20 years old as of writing this. Hopefully these are enough qualifiers to explain where it is I'm coming from. Over the past 70 years, universities went from being seen as one of the many pathways to a better future to practically the only publicly accepted pathway to any future altogether. 
In large part, this seems to be due to the increase in perceived value of college degrees, while a simultaneous restructuring of the K-12 system has pulled away from preparing people to live in a world after high school, and pushed towards systematic indoctrination to more easily conform people to a singular institutional pathway. This can be seen with the near-complete removal of any and all shop classes and home ec in high schools around the nation, which used to be able to provide important personal and life skills to these soon-to-be adults. The trades, though some of the most valuable jobs that exist in the modern world, are often looked down upon for not requiring degrees to certify ability, but rather offer on-the-job trading that takes a fraction of the time necessary to actually learn. Most of these labor-intensive jobs, like construction, vehicular repair, and their ilk are all outsourced to migrant populations and seen as necessary but valueless in today's world when realistically the day-to-day -day would not be possible without these jobs. Whereas schools used to be designed for the purpose of preparing a student for life outside itself, they have turned into factory farms manufacturing a specific mold of a successful person that cuts out all of what makes them unique and free thinking. Now if we look at the types of classes that students are required to take as part of their well-rounded experience, the first two years are nearly completely dedicated to retaking classes that we were already required in high school, just under new names. Rather than Algebra 1 and 2, you've got two semesters of college algebra. Don't mind the fact that the course syllabus is nearly identical in structure and material. Oh, you want to become a computer engineer? Well, you better make sure you got that philosophy course finished or we won't give you a degree. You want to become a chemical engineer? So you say it in Koine Greek and then we'll see what happens. There's far too much focus on what the college wants from you and not enough care for whether or not you're getting your money's worth. All right, look, before I dig too deep of a hole for myself, let me preface this section by saying I could not care less about what any single person believes politically, economically, religiously, or what have you for the purposes of this discussion. There are times for those, and that time is not now. Yes, I do hold very strong religious, political, and economic values. Yes, they are right of center most of the time, but do not mistake me for some sort of ideologue raging against the machine and riling up the population with no meritorious value. I'm here not to discuss the finer points of politics, for today at least, but rather to make educated and factual statements regarding the educational value of certain types of university classes over others. Alright? Okay. There's a massive push in the public university system to require cultural heritage and critical theory classes based around sex, race, and various backgrounds. Oftentimes, these classes, in a meritorious sense, give us nothing of value to our degrees, but require us to adopt certain ways of thinking and certain socio-political outlooks of the world to do well in them at all. You either have to be willing to lie through your teeth to your instructors, which I've never personally had a proclivity towards, or you have to willingly believe that that the world is absolutely dog shit, and that the only way to fix it is to demonize certain groups of people for what they have participated in by merely existing and having a difference of opinion from you. These are the requirements, and if you don't fit in, you're not welcome here. In fact, many of the most egregious examples of riotous activity have occurred on college campuses and are almost entirely populated by the students and professors alike willing to violently and publicly force these ideologies upon the masses. For those of us who want nothing more than to learn something valuable in the field of work that they had chosen for themselves, you better look out or be ready to spend two years being indoctrinated into beliefs you're likely to grow out of within the next 10 to 20 years and look back on in personal and sometimes public shame. Have fun. This is a rather matter-of-fact section that mostly deals with the corrupt practices around administration in universities. Nothing too fancy, but it comes with some baggage, certainly. Firstly, there's the problem of textbooks. The requirements to have certain editions, often with no major changes from various version to version, absolutely destroys the used textbook market and is often used as a way for professors and admins who wrote their own textbooks to make an immense profit margin off of minuscule amounts of work from year to year. 
And that's all without accounting for the salaries and bonuses of instructors who work the same amount of time throughout the year, but make an average of $10,000 more as starting positions than the veteran K-12 counterparts. These educators, often required or deciding to push for specific agenda in their instruction, can arbitrarily decide that a student whose views and work they disagree with just fail the class or barely pass and have a massive blemish on their university career and GPA, which is often a deciding factor in the ability to qualify for scholarships and loans from year to year. However, they've also almost unanimously received tenure and are therefore nigh infallible and untouchable. All of this under the guise that the administration of the college wouldn't be in their positions if they hadn't been meritoriously qualified to be there. Let's all turn our gaze from the donors and sponsors who fund these programs and admins. Now, while you can probably guess my views related to who should pay for college, a lean right of center, I also do not believe that the students should have to pay for as much as they already do. I think it absurd that students have to pay for the upkeep and usage of school utilities and functions that not even a tenth of the student body takes advantage of. The smart way to decide what a student pays for should be based on where they're housed, what amenities they choose to have access to, and only the materials and classes for which they have enrolled. It is not the burden of the people who have chosen not to go to university or have already graduated to pay for someone else's attendance. It's also not the burden of the student to have to pay for the construction of a new building on campus for classes and programs that they will not be able to take advantage of in their time. The law, especially with land-grant colleges, which would be the backbone of the creation of the state school system and eventually expand to all 50 states, required the burgeoning university to not spend an unnecessary or opulent amount of money on the construction and maintenance of school property. Tell that to Texas Tech, whose leisure pool includes a 645-foot lazy river, makes no sense to decide that the best use of a student's money is the construction of some building or amenity that they may never choose to use throughout their entire university career. Stop wasting our time, stop wasting our energy, stop wasting our money. All right, look. That's enough animosity for one week. As you can probably tell, it took an immense amount of time to write for this week, and I needed to revise multiple drafts in order to make this as little of a rant as possible. Next week, we're gonna wrap up this three-part series on the American University, and I'll go over what I think should be done to fix the system and why it may not be that important in the long run. I've still got a lot of research ahead of me, so please wish me luck there. And beyond that, just thank you for sticking it out with me. Once again, I'm sorry if this does sound like a rant. I've done everything I can to minimize that possibility, but it does remain. If you enjoy what I'm doing and you want to support my work, consider subscribing and turning on notifications for the channel to be notified of my next release. If you're feeling particularly generous, I've got a Patreon where you can support my work and get your name in the credits, as well as a merch store where you can pick up a shirt or sticker. I'm also experimenting with hats, as I said at the beginning of the video, but so far I've only got the 92 days hat. It is a trucker style hat. Uh, there is a new design each and every week to correspond with each video. And I plan on expanding the product line to include more types of clothes and accessories as time passes. Once again, thank you just for watching or listening or whatever you do while this plays in the background. It means the world to me that anyone chooses to click on this video. All right, I'll see you all next time.